Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. Do you want to start a podcast? I know I did. And you're listening to it. Thanks to the help of Anchor. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's totally free and has everything you need in a podcast in one place. You can record, edit your podcast right from your phone or computer and distribute it to listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Everything you need all in one place, completely free. What's stopping you? Go get Anchor. What happens when you get knocked down in the mortal words of Smash Mouth? Do you get back up again? Or do you say, nah, let me go do the impossible instead? That's what Sir Roger Bannister did back in the 1950s to be the first person to break the four-minute mile. Welcome to the Sports Moments Podcast, where every sports moment deserves its replay. I'm your host, Ethan Reese, your sports historian and giant goofball, which best describes this show, sports history and goofballness thrown in there. This is not a Dateline-only facts podcast. I will joke around, tell the most factually accurate story I can, but have a good time doing it. So now let's sit back and jump into the sports time machine. Selaja Banista, born March 23rd, 1929 in Harrow, London, does not have this terrible accent that I have. <laughs> Sorry for the terrible accent. Good know myself. Um, but he was born to, you know, Ralph and Alice Bannister, you know, working class family in Lincolnshire and, you know, the nor- normal family life. Ralph moved to London at the age of 15 to work with the civil service. And Alice, you know, he met on the trip home. A classic meet cute back in the day. You know, now that he had a job, he could land a lady. Because all the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies want a guy work for the civil service. <laughs> no. But it, it was back in the day when you had a job. It's when you kind of looked like you were a marriage material type of man. So they got married in 1925. Had a daughter named Joyce. And sh- a few years later, had Sir Raja Panasta. In case you don't know, sir means he's been knighted. You might hear that every now and then for, you know, there's some actors, musicians that have been knighted. Um, Lots of people get knighted. It's kind of their way in England of getting, like, the presidential medal or something like that. You get knighted by the queen. And so he is Sir Roger Bannister because he was knighted by the queen. So, the family, you know, the classic nuclear family, two kids, mom and dad, you know, leave it to beaver style, moved into Bath, England. Now, an interesting story about Bath, England. This place was named after these historical natural baths that they had there. And these baths were actually inhabited by mermaids. Crazy enough, these mermaids would bathe you in the natural baths and it would cause you to stop aging for up to a year. And if you went back every year, you know, you just would never age. 
And this was so common back in the day. You would have people passing away looking like they were in their 20s and 30s, but they were really like a 90, 100 years old, dying of natural causes. Crazy. This town was like, looked like it was a spring break town all the time because everyone looked young. crazy, crazy, crazy. And also so crazy that it's not even true. That's not why it's named that. You know, cities are normally named after who founds them. And that's kind of what we go here. It has nothing to do with mermaids or natural baths. <laughs> but, you know, this was a suburb. Classic, you know, family living in the suburbs. That's what, the, what this place was. And, unfortunately, this was around World War II. And in case you didn't know, the Axis, um, which were the bad guys, you say, you know, Germany, Hungary, those, those countries, were bombing everywhere. You know, bombing historical locations to get at the culture of the Allies. And this, you know, probably backfired because it made, you know, people more angry at the Axis than they were. So they wanted to beat them even more. So, oopsie. (laughs) But, you know, this also caused many civilians to lose their lives or be permanently injured. And luckily, the Bannister family had a shelter in their basement where they survived, you know, the bath blitz is what they called it, bombing over all these historical figures, and they lived near some of it. And a bomb went off near them enough that their house was severely damaged. So they are very lucky they had that shelter. And, you know, they went through this time. It's a, it's a hard time to live. And luckily, they, uh, you know, Roger made it because he had a lot to contribute, not only to, you know, the field of track and field, but also to the field of medicine. He was a neuroscientist for over 40 years. And so, you know, he went to school at the City Bath School for Boys because girls and boys cannot learn the same stuff. Come on. She needs to learn how to cook and clean, and he needs to learn about, you know, history and math. Um, They can't learn the same things. They can't go to the same school. Come on. What? No. This is so misogynistic, and it was just terrible. They... They did this because of that. Like they thought they needed to learn different things, and you know, maybe, but maybe men need to learn to cook and clean because we do. Sometimes I needed to learn to cook and clean, so it's not a bad thing to learn. And so, while he was there, though, they had this cross country event they did every year where they had a track around the school and they ran to see who the fastest kid in school was. Every year, three straight years in a row, Roger won. And it wasn't like he was the top dog, you know, especially that first year. He was a youngster, still beating guys, still beating guys that were his senior, and he was just a natural runner. And that led him to know that, hey, I might be able to use this to actually get to my dream. They were a working class family. They couldn't afford an expensive college or anything like that. He had to work to go to college. He's like, maybe I can use running as a way to get a scholarship. And that's what happened. He got a scholarship to Oxford because of his running ability. And that allowed him to continue his education that he wouldn't have got otherwise. And I think that's important to remember. He was using this not to become a famous runner, not not to become a professional athlete. He wanted to be a doctor. And he used his athletic ability to make that happen. I think that needs to be reminded that that's usually what sports scholarships is for for many people that get a scholarship for a sport aren't going to be a professional in that sport they're going to go into other fields and that's important to remember that they aren't just going to be an athlete they're going to be a student i think we forget that nowadays because our culture is like you go to school you get that scholarship and then you go become a pro it's not how it always works. And in Roger's case, he could have. He had the ability to, but he gave it up because he wanted to be a doctor. That's what he wanted to be. It wasn't about running for him. And so that's really how he ended up and started his running career, really exploded. So while Roger started at Oxford, he took a part-time job uh, in a chemist lab, you know, to help gain some knowledge uh, through chemistry, the medical practice. 
um, and you know, make some extra cash. He was on scholarship. He didn't have a whole lot of money. Working class family, of course. He, he took a job and it was a late night job, and he was working one night, and some things just weird things started to happen, like kind of bottles normally that were stagnant started to boil up and um, float a little bit, and then out of nowhere. This huge lightning bolt just struck the lab and threw all these chemicals on Roger. And he had no way of dodging it. And unfortunately, this event led to him going into a coma. But luckily, he eventually got out of a coma and realized these weird effects from the coma. Like... He had this insatiable appetite and his metabolism was off the charts. And he had the ability to run faster than he ever could imagine. Forget the four-minute mile. He ran the mile after he got up the first time in under four seconds. Because this is the story of how Roger Bannister became the Flash. That is obviously... Not true. <laughs> that is the origin story for Barry Allen, The Flash, in case you guys don't know, from DC Comics. That did not happen to him. But I like to think, you know, he's a runner. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, it would be awesome. <laughs> but no, 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 that did not happen. So he started at Oxford, and he really um, you know, was kind of the low man on the totem pole, as you are as a freshman going into college and I think what a lot of people don't realize is that's a huge change in mentality from going the big dog in high school to the little dog in college it, it can be um, it can mess with you a little bit but Roger did not do that even though he was placed as the low man on the totem pole he was being a rabbit um, for one of their races which is the guy that sets the pace for the longer mid to long runs. And he actually was started the race as the rabbit and then finished the race. He didn't stop when he was supposed to. And he actually won the race, you know, running faster than anyone else. And it was just, you know, crazy. And they're like, okay, I guess we got to put this guy out there. And that's really how he got his spot in uh, his Oxford track and field days. So it was a very unique way of getting – on the track to start out with. And this is also his first time wearing spikes. If you know anything about track and field, they all wear the spikes. Even long distance runners wear spikes. They're just not like huge spikes or little, literally bitty spikes. Um, but they, they didn't wear spikes where he grew up. And it was something that really does help you. If you've ever not worn spikes when you run and worn spikes, it's kind of the same way if you, uh, running grass cleats versus not cleats you really garner so much more traction it really helps you in your growth as a runner and your speed and so in doing all this you know this was before you know before this was like 1946 so this was before the 1948 olympics and like you know his time really as young as he is and as raw as he is he could be a possible olympic candidate but you know, being a, a, a new student at Oxford and really wanting his goal to be a, a, a doctor, he did not want to risk that. And so he himself pulled him out of the running to be an Olympian in that year because he wanted to be make sure that he could focus on his studies. And, you know, he did that. He was really impressive in that mold. He really focused on his studies. He you know, watched the Olympics that year. And he saw, like, hey, maybe I can actually do this. And so he set his goals for the 1952 Olympics to really be his way to do it. And that was a good – That's a, it makes a lot of sense. It's something that a lot of us wouldn't do because you want to have that notoriety and fame, you know, that, that, that greatness – but that wasn't his goal always. But he was a guy that set his goals and wanted to attain them. He was a very goal-oriented person, and he attained them as well as he could. So 
he set that goal, and that was when he was going to be basically in the prime of his life to really do it, the prime, you know, running years for him. And so he kept running, he kept training, he was getting better at training. This is something he hadn't done before. He had worn spikes, he hadn't really focused on training before. He was just running for the enjoyment of running, and now he got to actually train, and his time kept lowering and lowering. And he started to really focus on interval training, which is something that was kind of new in the day of not running. And another thing also in this time, you didn't train year round. You know, even now when he was training, you didn't train year round. You focused on seasons and in the off season, you didn't train as much. You stayed fit, but you didn't train. I know that seems kind of crazy in today's era of sports where you train year round for whatever you are doing. And this was not the case back in the day. So it was very kind of unusual for him to be training year round, but still this was more training than he had ever done before. So, at this time, too, most of the races he ran were 1,500 meters um, and a mile of 1,600 meters. Um, so, like, he really was not running the mile so much, but they could kind of extrapolate roughly on an average what it would be for a mile. So he was really kind of running the 1,500 around three minutes 48 seconds and so that was still going to be more than a four minute mile but it was lowering the gap on his races that he was running so he was start he was still training from 1951 to you know even after the olympics 1954 he would train at these tracks um you know near the school he was at he he was going to St. Mary's Hospital to do his rounds, and then he would go out to a, a recreational grounds near the, the hospital to train. He's, he would just always be there and always be training. He was not one trick pony. Remember, he was still during all of this, all of this story from now until he actually sets the record, he was a student full time. So he avoided r racing after the 1951 season until the, the late spring of 1952. He wanted to save his energy. So this is back where I talked about they didn't train year-round. And he was also an 800-meter runner. He was, I guess, the mile is kind of a mid-tier race. You either are a 800 kind of more sprinter runner or you're a distance runner that's coming down. You're, it's, it's kind of in the middle, and you got to kind of pick which way you're kind of coming from to run it. Usually you're not just a 1,600-meter runner. So he was an 800-meter runner as well. So he you know, made the team for the Olympics, qualified for the team. In the time trials, he qualified uh, for the 1,500-meter the uh, with four minutes, 10 seconds, or that's the mile he he ran. Sorry. And um, he was kind of good with that. that was, he was just trying to qualify. He wasn't trying to set the record at that point. So, you know, he got to the 1,500-meter finale for the Olympics. He didn't have any issues up until that point, running great. Um, and he was running really well. And this race was one of the – close races and sometimes in these longer mid-tier races you kind of separate out but there, there was a lot of people you know four guys were really jostling for that final lap came around and they were still up in the front of the pack and he was following close but eventually you know a Luxembourg Joey Bathel you know, eventually set the Olympic record while they were running this three minutes, 45 seconds. And the next seven runners were all under the 
re- the Olympic record. So, like, that's how close and how strong this was. It wasn't just, like, a few guys. They were all really jostling for this. And, you know, even though he set the British record at 3 minutes 46 seconds and point three. He finished fourth. He did not earn a medal in this Olympics. And I think that's something we forget because this will be his last Olympic Games. And he never earned an Olympic medal in all this time, even though he's known for what he does a couple years later. Ne- not an Olympic medalist. And that's crazy to think about that you can be the greatest athlete, but you got to remember the Olympics is four years. Every four years, that's a long time for people to kind of their lives change, their athletic abilities change, new people come up, and they get become in their prime as you go out of your prime, and it happens a lot. And I know today's day and age, athletes usually go to at least two Olympics, if not more. Three sometimes if they are really incredible and they come in at the right age. And that's another big factor, coming in at the right age. If you don't come in when you're 18 or in your teens, you're probably not going to go to three Olympics. If you come in in your 20s, you might get two, maybe. Back then, you know, this wasn't giving paying your bills. And even now, Olympics... Olympians aren't usually getting their bills paid for unless they are a higher tier sport. They're usually not getting their bills paid for. A lot of Olympians are not getting paid what you think they are, even though they could be huge in, in, like in that moment of time for the Olympics, they're quickly forgot about and quickly don't have the money to just do this full time. So after this failure, is when he really set the goal. He's like, I got knocked down, but I'll get up again. He ain't never going to keep me down. That's the way he was. He would not get down. He would not give up. And when he set a goal, he did everything to obtain it. And even though he was still trying to get his degree, he didn't feel accomplished enough to finish you know, running. He wanted to keep running and finish and, and go out on a high note. So, you know, he kind of looked towards his mentor, uh, Sidney Wooderson, was a guy, not his mentor, but an idol, role model. Uh, he was a Englishman, you know, had set the mile record years previously. And, you know, he just never gave up. And even after he went to war in World War II, he came back. The record had already been broken by some Swedish runners. He trained himself to try to get that record back. And he eventually got the British record back, but he did not get the world record back from them. But, you know, that training of not giving up after, you know, you get knocked down a little bit, really coming back. And that's really what he kind of looked towards for himself. So he set the goal of being the first man to run the mile in under four minutes. This has never been done. The record was at 4.1.4. That record had been set in 1944 by, you know, Gunder Hag, one of the Swedish guys I was talking about that beaten his role model, had set the record. And that was 1945, and it had not been beaten since. No one had really gotten close since. Everyone just kind of assumes, you know, I guess we re- reached the peak of the human body. You can't go any higher. And obviously we know now that's not the case, but back then medical science wasn't what it was today. And so really they didn't have the knowledge that, hey, this could be the end of what we can do as a human species. And that is really tough. But, you know, all the time we're trying to shatter records. So he did all that he could do to focus on this. And guess what? He wasn't the only one. So this event that they thought would be a great time to really go after 
the goal. May 6, 1954, at a meet between the British AAA and the Oxford University at Iffy Road Track in Oxford. There was 3,000 spectators in attendance, which for a track event, like just between two schools, a lot. <laughs> and they thought this was going to be a great time, but unfortunately, you know, winds had picked up 25 miles an hour. It was rainy, kind of wet, mushy. Like, it was not really the best running conditions. And he said he Bannister didn't really want to run. He wanted to conserve his energy to try to break the record at a better time, but it was better. And he's like, you know what? We'll give it a try. So the race was broadcast live by BBC radio. And like this time they kind of knew what they were trying to do, trying to get to that record. And so Bannister began his day at the hospital, you know, sharpening his spikes, rubbing the graphite on them. And he would, Really go there nervous about the rainy winning conditions, but you know, there there weren't that many men running, and so he could really focus on what he was doing and following his pacemakers, which were gonna be setting the pace faster than normally you would set the pace. So the race began as scheduled, 6 p.m., and Bastion and Bannister went immediately to the front of the pack. And they led the first lap with 58 seconds. In the half mile, they got to one minute, 58 seconds. So on pace to really break this record. And then Bannister tucked in behind Chataway, who took the next leg as the rabbit, as the pacemaker for them. Stride behind him, Bannister kept going. And he yelled at him, faster, faster. He did not want to give up. He was pushing. He was pushing to make this time go. And at this point, the pace was set. The third lap, they finished three minutes, one second. Now, Bannister was known as finishing that final lap under a minute. So at this point, it was not inconceivable that he could actually do this. To be able to set three minutes, I know it's a little bit above you know, what you would want to get there, but he was a final lap finisher. So he began his final kick to finish this, to get his final lap under 59 seconds. And you've probably seen his finish where it looks like a guy that literally left his all on the track. That picture of uh, when with him crossing the finish line, search Roger Bannister. That's the first picture you'll see of him with his head back, reaching out with his foot and like, oh, I let everything out. I let everything out on the course. And they come over the announcements. And they go, ladies and gentlemen, here are the results for the one mile. First, Roger Bannister with a time of three. And as soon as he said three, the crowd erupted. Nobody heard what the rest of the time was. They just heard three. And that he was now the first person that had broken the four-minute mile. It was an incredible sight to be the first person to claim this. It was a world record. It was the first person to do this seemingly impossible thing that could never be done. And he beat the world record by 1.4 seconds, ending with a time of 3 minutes, 59 seconds, 0.4. It was something that had never been done before. And sadly, he would only have it for 46 days. You no, know, Yeah, those two other guys, the three of them were battling for it. When you battle, sometimes someone else gets it too. And now we'll go into one of the greatest rates after it, where he breaks his own record, but yet doesn't win the race. The 1954 British Commonwealth Games 
you know, pitted Landy, John Landy, the guy he was challenging from Australia that had just broken his record 46 days after he, he ran it, you know, and now they were battling each other. The two guys had just broken this four minute barrier and the records were being broken back and forth. They were now battling each other face to face. So they were running this race for the mile at the Commonwealth Games. And Landy led most of the race, building a lead of 10 yards in the third lap. But he was overtaken at the last spin because Bannister was a guy that finished that fourth lap. That's what he did. And what happened was Landy was checked over his shoulder to see where Bannister was, to see where he was at. And that's when Bannister took that opportunity to pass him. Bannister won with a time of 3 minutes, 58 seconds, 0.8. With Landy, 0.8 seconds behind him, right there. Barely won, but won all it was. And that was, you know, one of Bannister's only medals. And it wasn't an Olympic medal. You know, it was a Commonwealth Game medals, which is still important, but, you know, still not what you think of. And shortly after this, you know, he, he was done. Bannister accomplished what he wanted to do and retired from athletics to concentrate on becoming a doctor. You know, he had became the best at running at that time. And now he wanted to focus on becoming the best doctor at that time and pursuing a, a path into neurology. So he, he retired, and for the next 40 years, he practiced medicine, you know, doing clinical work, research work, and also being an educator in the field of neurology. You know, his major contributions, you know, was to autonautic failure, focusing on illness, characters, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an illness by the loss of certain automatic responses in the nervous system. For example, an elevated heart rate when you stand up. And we also had things about the automatic nervous system, cardiovascular psychology, muscle system, atrophy, and so much more. You know, this is all medical stuff, and I don't know much about medical stuff. And he was a great doctor by all accounts. You know, he led, he was on multiple boards and everything. He was Focus on being a doctor. Remember, he was a doctor for 40 years and only a runner for eight. So in 1955, shortly after he retired, he married a Swedish artist, Myra Elva Jacobson in Switzerland. You know, and she was the daughter of a economist, Pierre Scrip- Jacobson, who served, you know, in the International Monetary Fund as the director. They ended up having four kids, you know, Carol, Civil, Thurston, and Charlotte. And in 54, not 54, 74, he was knighted. Sorry, not 74. In 75, 1975, was when he was knighted by the Queen and became Sir Roger Bannister. I want to say the third. That sounds to be fitting, but you know, he wasn't the third. Currently, the record for the mile is set at 3 minutes, 43 seconds. That's insanely fast and much faster than Roger said it. But this was set in 1999. That's a huge gap. It's been over 20 years and no one's broken it. But I'm sure if someone had the drive to break it, they would. And, you know, it was set um, from a guy from Morocco Hichama El Girdro. I'm probably saying that wrong. Sorry. Um, he, he he holds up many other you know long distance records, but you also remember like if you don't have that challenge of a person, if you are already setting the record for that year, you're winning every race. To push yourself to beat the record can be hard if no one else is pushing you to do that. 
Roger got lucky because he wasn't the only one pushing for this. He set that goal at the time because he lost, but he wasn't the only one that set that goal. And having other people push him really helped elevate his status. That's Roger Bannister. You know, a great guy, a guy without an Olympic record that set a world record, a guy without an Olympic gold medal or an Olympic medal at all set the world record. Not something you see very often, but that's what happened. Thank you for listening to the Sports Moments Podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's tale. If you did, please give us a review or five stars or wherever you listen to. It helps us grow our community and help tell more engaging stories. You can follow us at Sports Moments Pod on Instagram and Twitter. We post pictures about stories, what happened today in history, different things like that. Just try to be a good sports overall social media company. We still are a new podcast. We're still growing, still working on a few kinks, still working on our website. So if you would like to contact us with a great topic or your view on any episode we've done, you can email us at sportsmomentspodcast at gmail.com. And as we grow, we're looking for great youth sports charities to donate to because I think it's important to give the youth a chance to learn about sports and bring that love so they can become sports historians as well so if you have a, a great charity that you are involved in or you think we should help out please contact us as well again thank you for listening and come back next week for another episode of the sports moments podcast where every sports moment deserves its freedom At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.